Welcome to Physical Chemistry 2. In this lecture, we will apply the relationships that we learned for the chemical potential to um, single uh, substance and mixed phase systems. And we will learn a little bit more about the significance of the chemical potential. So with the chemical potential, we have one of the most important quantities of chemical thermodynamics here. Yeah? Um, most of the considerations about thermal and chemical equilibrium, uh, equilibrium that follow yeah, in this section will be carried out with the uh, help of this relationship here. Yeah? Therefore, we will first take a closer look uh, at the properties of the chemical potential itself. Yeah? So let us uh, first assume that we have a pure homogeneous substance in an open system. Yeah? Then one of our uh, Gibbs fundamental, uh, fundamental relations, you yeah, have a change in free enthalpy, dg, here in equation 383, changes pretty much to here equation 4.1. Yeah, so it means dg equals minus sdt plus vdp plus uh, mu dn. Yeah? Now at constant pressure and temperature, we get uh, here our, uh, our relationship reduces to delta G over delta N at constant pressure and temperature equals our chemical potential. Yeah. So when we compare now our expression 4.2 yeah, and our expression 4.1, we pretty much find that uh, mu is numerically equal to the change yeah, in free enthalpy of our system. Yeah, if we add it, if we add to it uh, one more mole of a substance. Yeah. However, we can also interpret here equation 4.2 that mu, the chemical potential, is equal to the molar free enthalpy of a substance. Yeah. So we can now create uh, an analogous set of dependencies for an open system here. So that's our model system two. Yeah, um, and this open system uh, will contain several components. Yeah, in that case, our Gibbs fundamental relation here, 3.83, transforms to uh, uh, dg at constant pressure at temperature is the sum over all chemical potentials times dni. So it means that this uh, the chemical potential of one. Yeah, and the molar uh, fraction here, DN, dn1 times mu2 dn2 plus so on and so on. Yeah, and with k components, we've got finally mu k times uh, dnk. Yeah, so it's our equation 4.3. Yeah, um, and we get now also a general expression yeah, for the chemical potential. Uh, of components Ni. Yeah, so that's given here. So the numerical value yeah, of this chemical potential mu i of component i would then be given simply by the change in free enthalpy of a system yeah, when one mole of component i is added to it. Yeah? However, uh, essentially since mu i is concentration dependent, yeah, the composition uh, of a phase must not change in the process. Yeah, this means uh, that we would either have to add one mole of component I to a very large, yeah, theoretically infinite amount of a phase, yeah, or we would have to calculate the change in G caused by one mole yeah, um, from the change in G caused by a very small amount of DNI. Yeah, so this would be fairly tricky. So equation 4.3 gives us now the change of free enthalpy dg yeah, at constant uh, pressure and temperature uh, if we vary the amounts of substance dni. Yeah? So we'll now try to give a free enthalpy of a mixed phase yeah, of certain pressure, temperature and i as a function of ni. Yeah? So for this purpose, let's first consider uh, within our entire system, a limited subsystem, yeah, for which the free enthalpy has a value gt, yeah, and the mass quantities have a values 
uh, value uh, yeah, values NIT. Yeah. So uh, when we expand this subsystem here yeah, to the entire system, uh, we essentially get here by integration um, for the increase of free enthalpy at constant temperature, pressure, and chemical potential. Yeah, we can do this uh, calculation here. Yeah, and we can substitute uh, um, Ni over N1 as beta 1. Yeah, so that it looks a little bit more neat. Uh, we essentially get by integration our equation 4.4 and 4.5. Yeah, so we essentially go from GT, yeah, that's the free enthalpy of our confined subsystem, to G. Yeah, so that's our entire system. Yeah, DG at PT equals the sum of mu i times beta i yeah and the integral between n1t yes yeah, so that's the starting mass quantities in our confined subsystem to n1 yeah the entire uh, amount of substances in the system yeah integrate this over dn1 yeah so for this we essentially get yeah, we just plug in the numbers pretty much that's g minus gt yeah at constant pressure at temperature is the sum of the chemical potential i times n i minus n i t yeah why do we do a substitution well because this uh, gives us a nicer integrals okay so if we now uh, make our initial system so small yeah that it tends to zero yeah then we get gt goes uh, goes uh, uh, to zero and nit yeah, the mass quantities also go to zero yeah, so with our totals uh, for our total system, yeah, we get then equation 4.6. Yeah, so if all of these quantities go to zero, plug zeros in here, yeah, we essentially get G uh, at constant pressure and temperature is the sum of all the chemical potentials I times uh, uh, the mass quantities N I. Yeah, so these relationships are super useful, and you will see that in the workshop examples. Because now we can pretty much unambiguously determine the state uh, of a mixed phase yeah, by specifying the amounts of substance uh, and the chemical potentials yeah, for a given pressure and temperature. So consider again a system um, that consists of uh, a pure homogeneous substance yeah, at fixed pressure and temperature. And let us assume that... Uh, uh, the chemical potential is not the same at all points of a phase, yeah, but uh, it is uh, uh, mu a, yeah, in part a, and mu b in part b, yeah. So if we now transfer DNA mole, yeah, from a to b, we would expect a change in the free enthalpy, yeah, and this is essentially given here in equation 4.7, yeah. So we we transfer um, a DNA mole yeah, from part A to part B of the same substance, yeah, but at different potentials. So we get DG equals mu B minus mu A times DNA. All right. So now we haven't said anything about the relative magnitudes yeah, of the chemical potentials A and B. So we can now consider, mind you, purely mathematically, yeah, we can consider these three cases. Yeah. So if the chemical potential A is larger than the chemical potential B, yeah, then it follows from this relationship that uh, dG uh, must be smaller than zero. Yeah? If the chemical potential A is smaller than the chemical potential B, yeah, then dG is larger than zero. Yeah? And finally, in the case that mu A equals mu B, yeah, then dG is also uh, uh, is equal to zero. Yeah, so now you will remember from our lecture on equilibria, I think, yeah, that DG can tell us uh, something about spontaneity yeah, and equilibrium with constant pressure and temperature, yeah, where we essentially are right now. So in the third case, yeah, this would essentially correspond to equilibrium. Yeah, so this the third case, that's equilibrium. Oh, it doesn't quite fit in there, does it? So let's write it just beneath. Yeah, so this is equilibrium. Okay. 
In the second case, yeah, where dg equal uh, is uh, positive, yeah, we know this is thermodynamically impossible, yeah. So in other words, a substance cannot spontaneously transition from areas of lower chemical potential, yeah, to areas of higher chem chemical potential, yeah. In the first case, yeah, dg smaller than zero, yeah. This would correspond to a spontaneous process. So in other words, a substance passes spontaneously from areas of higher chemical potential yeah, to areas of lower chemical potential. Yeah? And this will happen until the chemical potentials in both areas are balanced. Yeah? And when the chemical potentials are balanced, yeah, then we're automatically here in case three, yeah, and we have reached equilibrium. All right. So let's just bring in the next bit of the slide. Yeah, so this is essentially now here summarizing it uh, a little bit. Yeah. So we have now a very yeah, spontaneous mass transfer only from areas of higher mu to areas of lower mu. Yeah. So now we have a very descriptive interpretation of uh, this obscure quantity mu. Yeah. Compare this to the flow of electric current yeah, under the gradient of the electric potential. Yeah, or the flow of water, yeah, according to the level gradient of a terrain, yeah, going from high to low, or the gas flows through the pipes yeah, under pressure gradient, yeah, and like so, the mass transfer in a thermodynamic system occurs only under a gradient of a chemical potential. Yeah, and we've seen this concept in action already, yeah, where we're considering effusion and diffusion, yeah, which you all should remember from previous lectures. Okay, so this is not only valid for mass transfer with a pure homogeneous phase, yeah, we're learning the general cases, but it's also true, yeah, for transition, uh, for the transition from one phase to another, yeah, so equilibrium between the phases exists, uh, uh, yeah, when dg at constant pressure and temperature is zero, yeah, so that means mu a equals mu b yeah and um, a spontaneous process yeah like a transition of a substance from one phase to the other can only happen when dg at constant pressure and temperature is smaller than zero yeah now let's consider two more cases yeah so What's happening when mu a is larger than mu b? Yeah, if it's a spontaneous process, what does it mean? Yeah, it means that dna must be smaller than zero. Yeah, so what does it mean for the transition? Yeah, we essentially get a transition. Yeah, remember the phase diagrams. Yeah, transition from a to b. Yeah. And the opposite case, mu a is smaller than mu b. Again, if it's a spontaneous process, dg is smaller than zero. Yeah, from this follows, dna must be. Uh, oh, there is a mistake here. Sorry about this. Yeah, so this should be larger than zero now. Yeah, so careful with that. Yeah, so that means essentially here we would have in a spontaneous process a transition from b to a yeah so if you find that confusing yeah essentially take these considerations open the notes on our phase transitions and see whether you can apply them there yeah so this is absolutely generally applicable so in dynamic processes yeah we can express Gibbs fundamental relations here, yeah, in terms of a reaction coordinate or a reaction coefficient, yeah, or reaction time, xi, yeah, as seen here in equation 4.8. So it's dNi equals vi times d xi, yeah. So we get uh, um, essentially our fundamental relations simply become here 4.9 by 
direct substitutions here we get dA equals minus SDT minus PDV yeah, as seen before and now we plug in 4.8 is a sum of VI times mu I times our reaction coefficient and yeah, same goes for DG yeah so we get minus SDT plus VDP plus the sum over uh, of VI times mu I and times the change in reaction coefficient okay so from this follows simply by integration yeah that the quantities delta A and delta G are except for the sign the reversible work performed during a chemical reaction yeah, excluding the volume work mind you yeah because we're working here at constant volume or constant pressure respectively yeah so now compare uh, the expression for delta G we got here yeah with the one for the chemical potential we got previously yeah now it's the same trick which we applied previously yeah so whatever holds true for dg yeah at constant pressure and temperature must also obviously apply to delta g over delta z, uh, xi yeah at constant pressure and temperature yeah so we essentially get here our expression for the free reaction enthalpy at constant pressure and temperature so delta g at constant pressure and temperature equals delta uh, delta g over delta xi at, con at, uh, at p constant pt yeah and this is quite obviously equal to vi times mu i yeah and now again we can uh, apply our considerations for uh, delta G yeah so delta G at constant pressure and temperature is zero yeah when we have chemical equilibrium yeah and we've seen now yeah that a chemical reaction can only take place yeah if delta G is smaller than zero yeah but this also means yeah that the uh, um, chemical reaction can only take place under a gradient of the chemical potential yeah so with me uh, and this is because of this uh, sum yeah of vi times mu i yeah the sum of the chemical potential potentials of reaction products and starting materials um, multiplied by the stoichiometric factors must be smaller than zero so now we've familiarized ourselves with the meaning of a chemical potential yeah it's essentially a gradient and that will give us some idea about when equilibrium comes about um, and uh, when, when processes are spontaneous and to, in, in which direction they go yeah um, so now uh, we must consider the relationships yeah of a chemical potential to other thermodynamic quantities yeah so according to our uh, equation 4.2 here yeah for the chemical potential for pure substance yeah this chemical potential for pure substance is identical yeah with a molar free enthalpy g of the substance yeah so uh, chemical potential yeah of a pure substance it's identical to the molar free en uh, enthalpy small g of this particular substance yeah so it is uh, it means the chemical potential is simply a function yeah of any given temperature and pressure now for the mixed phase yeah according to our equation 4.3 the chemical potential yeah mu i um, of component i is identical to the partial molar free enthalpy dg yeah of this component and so it depends not only on temperature and pressure yeah but it also depends on all the other concentrations yeah, of all other components yeah so this makes things a little bit difficult so now if we consider the temperature and pressure dependence yeah of a chemical potential yeah these these dependencies are identical to the dependencies of a molar free enthalpy for a pure substance yeah if we have a mixed phase yeah the same relationships hold yeah if we consistently replace the molar quantities with the partial molar quantities yeah uh, so in this we can state here yeah in 4.15 so this looks fairly complex but we essentially use our 
relations that we derived previously yeah, plug all of this in and uh, we've seen this term already yeah delta g over delta t at constant p, uh, p is essentially minus s yeah the entropy for this process so and this essentially is coming out as the entropy of component i yeah so how do we get there well we are uh, essentially use all these derivatives yeah fundamental relations plug them in okay so now remember uh, essentially that the expressions yeah for pressure and temperature dependence of a free enthalpy yeah, that we derived uh, in previous lecture seven yeah so this is here given in this darker box yeah we can now use them to derive the pressure and temperature dependence yeah, of a chemical potential. So let's look at this. There we go. Yeah, so what does that mean? Yeah, in equation 4.16, yeah, this, this relationships, uh, relationship here allows us to calculate the chemical potential yeah, for any temperature at constant pressure. Yeah. If we have a chemical potential at a specific temperature one, yeah, and the entropy of a substance, yeah, as a function of temperature, then we can just plug that into the equation and solve for the unknown chemical potential at temperature two. Yeah, and you will see this in application. So what about equation 4.17? Yeah, well, that allows us to calculate the chemical potential, yeah, for any given pressure again at constant temperature yeah given that we know the chemical potential yeah at a, a certain pressure yeah preferably the standard pressure um, yeah and the pressure dependence of a molar volume yeah so you might have seen already yeah the notation for standard pressure yeah so we will we will circle back to that in the next slides so standard Quantities are denoted with this little circle. Yeah, so for standard pressure, we would essentially get the following notation. Okay, so let's do some example applications of these uh, dependency equations here on the next slide. So we'll try this out for uh, the case of a pure ideal gas yeah, and a pure real gas. We'll start out with the first case, yeah, the ideal gas. So we will only deal with pure substances in both cases. Yeah? Let's consider now uh, for, the, for the ideal gas, yeah, so essentially from equation 4.17 yeah, follows our equation 4.18. Yeah? So essentially uh, um, the integral uh, of a chemical potential pressure one to a ke uh, chemical potential pressure uh, P2 yeah, of d mu equals to uh, integral between P1 and P2 of V dP. Yeah? So we essentially take this relationship here, yeah, essentially transfer dP over here and then do the integrals. Yeah? So now we can uh, essentially substitute uh, um, the molar volume here, V, yeah, using the ideal gas law, yeah, PV equals NRT. Um, yeah, so we essentially get uh, here our equation 4.19. So we, uh, since we're already dealing with a molar volume, so this is V divided by small n, yeah, we essentially get here uh, this integral of d mu equals rt times the integral between p1 and p2 uh, of 1 p dp yeah and this is uh, essentially rt yeah between p1 and p2 of d l and p all right and equivalent yeah we can essentially solve this yeah we get uh, chemical potential or at pressure 2 minus chemical potential at pressure 1 equals rt times uh, the log between uh, of the quotient of the two pressures. Yeah, so now let's substitute uh, the standard pressure. Yeah, for P1. Yeah, so we can essentially now get uh, uh, write the chemical potential of the ideal gas at any pressure P. Yeah, as K 
chemical potential equals the standard chemical potential plus RT times LNP over P standard. Yeah, super useful equation. Yeah, you will see, and you will get to use that in the workshop questions. So in the second case, we consider real gas. Yeah, so we must substitute the molar volume here in equation 417 by the um, applicable thermal equation of state. Yeah, now uh, you haven't encountered this yet, but we've seen already when we are uh, dealing with ideal gas behavior, yeah, that there are some differences between the gases. So uh, the ideal gas law is called so, yeah, PV equals NRT, it's called so for a reason. Yeah, so this is the essentially a more correct description yeah, of gases, which applies to real gases is given here by this virial equation. Yeah, so this is essentially PV equals NRT, so that's only the first virial coefficient, yeah, plus NBP plus NCP squared and so on and so on. Yeah. So uh, we can essentially truncate this entire equation a little bit yeah, by just including the second virial coefficient. Yeah? So the second virial coefficient is B in this case, and this will give us already a relationship uh, between volume and temperature yeah, uh, and amount of sample to a sufficient uh, degree of accuracy. Yeah? And this will hold true for many examples which you might encounter in the real world. Okay, um, so the first term, uh, RT, yeah, as, as, uh, as you said, uh, as we said, uh, you know this from the ideal gas law, so that's called the first uh, virial coefficient, yeah, and, N, and, and BP is the second virial coefficient. Okay, so um, now we get instead of our uh, equation 419, which we saw on the previous slide, yeah, when we plug in for VI, we get the following here for uh, 23, yeah, V equals RT over P plus B, yeah, so if we plug this into, um, if we do essentially the integrals again, yeah, we get here, yeah, equals RT, yeah, integral between P1 and P2, DL and P, plus B integral between P1 and P2, DP, yeah, and accordingly, yeah, we get the chemical potential at pressure 2 yeah, minus the chemical potential at pressure 1 equals RT ln P2 over P1 yeah, plus yeah, the second virial coefficient times P2 minus P1. Yeah? So now we can again substitute yeah, our standard pressure P uh, um, for P1 yeah, and we can write the chemical potential of a real gas at any pressure P. Yeah, again, super useful equation. You yeah, note here uh, the way how this definition goes: um, the, the second virial coefficient yeah, times the standard pressure is equal to zero. Yeah, so it means if we choose a P uh, a two, which is not too far away uh, from the standard pressure, yeah, then essentially it's sufficiently low that this uh, um, this BP, uh, where is it? Yeah, but essentially the yeah in this integral, yeah, uh, if we plug in P1 for P1, our standard pressure, yeah, then automatically this multiplication here, B times P2 and B times P standard, yeah, this term will fall away. Yeah, so we get for our um, chemical potential here. Uh, is equal to standard chemical potential plus RT ln P over P0 plus BP. Yeah, so again, super useful equation from which you now can derive a chemical potential of a real gas at any pressure P. So now we see that for real gases, yeah, we get a different result for the chemical potential, yeah, than in the case for the ideal gas. Yeah? Now, of course, the ideal gas relationship is much easier to work with. Yeah? So for thermodynamic calculations, it would be desirable yeah, if we could convert this slightly cumbersome uh, equation here to something which looks a bit more like this. Yeah? So this is only possible, really, if we introduce um, a corrected pressure yeah, for the real gas. So 
let's call this corrected pressure fugacity yeah, and give it the uh, symbol FG. Yeah, so you will find this uh, uh, vocabulary in, in some textbooks and some problems in particular in, in engineering. Yeah? So if fugacity is chosen um, uh, such as uh, described here in equation 4.27, yeah? so we get then essentially uh, when we plug this in, yeah, uh, we, we get uh, that the real chemical potential is equal to the standard chemical pro potential plus RT times LN, the fugacity over standard pressure. Yeah. So now the relation uh, between the fugacity and the real pressure is given by the fugacity coefficient, small phi. So you see that here in the expression 429. Yeah? The fugacity Fg equals uh, phi times the real pressure. Yeah? So now combining essentially uh, equation 426 here and, uh, and equation 427, yeah, we get RT times LN phi times P over P0 equals RT times LN P over P0 plus BP. Yeah? So this was our original expression. Yeah? So we can now um, uh, solve for ln phi, yeah, so we get ln phi equals B over RT times real pressure. Yeah, now you might wonder, was this really worth the effort? Well, uh, the fugacity is actually a very important quantity in real life processes. Yeah, and you can sort of see here, yeah, from this table, uh, just how much the pressure, yeah, and the fugacity differ from each other. Yeah, this is this is here given for nitrogen at uh, 273k. Yeah, so you can sort of see the pressure 1000 bar and fugacity. Actually, the corrected pressure is 1810. Yeah, so in real life scenarios, this will come in handy. So this brings us to the end of lecture eight. Yeah, next time around, we will be looking at uh, chemical potential in mixtures. Yeah, and some colligative properties of matter. See you next time.